Our next speaker is Lizzie O'Shea. Lizzie is a solicitor who practices in public interest law. She's worked at the International Labour Organization in Geneva, monitoring compliance with international labour standards. She undertook a voluntary internship recently in Louisiana, the USA, with a capital defence office working with indigenous prisoners on death row. She is now the head of Morris Blackburn Solicitors Social Justice Practice. On the 7th of December 2010, a cable from WikiLeaks, published by The Guardian, revealed that US Embassy officials thought President Ben Ali's regime in Tunisia was sclerotic and without a clear successor. The cable noted that many Tunisians were, quote, frustrated by the lack of political freedom and angered by first family corruption, high unemployment and regional inequities. A month later, Ben Ali was forced out of the country on a wave of popular protest. And since then, as a direct result of what happened in Tunisia, we've seen something close to a revolution in Egypt. And there are demonstrations taking place in Yemen, Syria, Algeria, Bahrain and Libya. Now, there's a lot of silly things being said about what's going on in the Arab world. We're told that what's happening in Tunisia is a WikiLeaks revolution and what's going on in Egypt is a Twitter revolution. Well, quite, que quite clearly, they're not. It's a revolution of the people of Egypt and Tunisia and it belongs to them. It belongs to those people who are going out on the streets and fighting for their freedom. Already, hundreds have been killed by Mubarak thugs and many, many more have been injured. And the inspiring mass gatherings of humanity that we've seen on the streets of Cairo, in spite of this horrendous violence, really do matter. So, these uprisings were not caused by WikiLeaks. They were caused by the same things that always cause revolts, economic hardship, uh, political persecution, and the simple determination of ordinary people to build a better life for themselves and their children. But it's also clear from the last weeks that the digital revolution and the new platforms that it gives rise to, including WikiLeaks, are important and they have the power to make a profound difference. It seems that Facebook and Twitter are more than just a way for Justin Bieber to annoy us all. <laughs> if you don't know who Justin Bieber is, I can explain it to you later. <laughs> the cables released by WikiLeaks made no bones about the state of politics in Tunisia. As The Guardian has noted, there was a hunger for the cables in countries that didn't have a fully functioning democracy or a free press, just like Tunisia. They did not reveal anything particularly new that Tunisians did not already know, but with the help of these new digital platforms, they acted as a lightning rod for the widespread discontent that already existed. Now, one of the, di the dictators that's under threat by the turmoil in the Arab world is Muammar Gaddafi. And in the wake of the Tunisian revolt, uh, Gaddafi offered some of his worldly wisdom about both WikiLeaks and the internet. And I think it's worth quoting in full. He says, this internet, which any demented person, any drunk can get drunk and write in, do you believe it? The internet is like a vacuum cleaner. It can suck anything. Uh, any useless person, any liar, any drunkard, anyone under the influence, anyone high on drugs can talk on the internet and you read what he writes and you believe it. One wonders if you've actually ever been on the internet. <laughs> but I think it's worth reflecting on what Gaddafi is saying and what underpins his attack on WikiLeaks as well. It's the authentic rhetoric of tyranny. He's outraged that the internet allows not just presidents and kings and generals to be heard, but literally any useless person can speak their mind. <laughs> and in that sense, new media forms are democratising. They allow people to speak. They spread information in a way that the government can't control. And it's no surprise then that one of the acts of desperation of the flailing Egyptian regime was to literally shut down the internet and then try to shut down Al Jazeera. And it's no surprise to me then that the US government is trying to shut down WikiLeaks. Indeed, the power of these new media platforms is evident right here in this room. To get people here on four days' notice, and I thank you all for coming, I've been tweeting furiously about the event, GetUp is live streaming this on the internet, and Facebook has literally thousands of members of groups supporting WikiLeaks in all number of different languages. And I'd like to say hello to everybody out there in the square who's bearing the disgusting heat to listen to what we're saying. And even when the internet was shut down in Egypt, Google provided a voice to tweet service for people who were on the ground. The potential of these kinds of networks is genuinely astounding. 
And if any of the more mature members of the audience would like a demonstration in how to tweet, you're welcome to come and see me afterwards. The point is, when WikiLeaks provides information to these new digital platforms, and it is information that the government wants suppressed, it's a very powerful mix. It can act as a catalyst, it can break the cycle of political monotony and cynicism, and it can convince people that change is possible. So, importantly, what the cables have done is that they've allowed us to know the truth about what our governments do and say. They act as a barometer for us to test the rhetoric of government against what we now know they're really thinking. And this was clearly true of the wars in both Afghanistan and Iraq, where the information released by WikiLeaks painted a picture of a military quagmire. We were told this was a war that was necessary for democracy, but in fact, it is bloody, expensive, and basically unwinnable. Or more specifically, we look to the Middle East again. WikiLeaks reveals that in private, embassy officials believe that the Egyptian police and security services were corrupt and violent foot soldiers for the Mubarak regime. But in public, the US government has been pouring $2 billion in military and economic aid into Egypt every year. Indeed, in March 2010, in response to a question about Egypt's human rights record, Hillary Clinton replied that, we consider Egypt to be a friend and we all have room for improvement. <laughs> this is a contender for understatement of the year. The widespread atrocities of the Egyptian regime in particular were once again no secret. Human Rights Watch has been reporting on them publicly for years. But the release of these cables by WikiLeaks adds a new dynamic because it shows what, that the US government was very happy to work with what Noam Chomsky calls useful gangsters. So what is a useful gangster? Well, Egypt, for a long time, has been assisting the US government with its extraordinary rendition program. This charming system allows the US to abduct people and extrajudicially transfer them to countries known to practice torture. What WikiLeaks tells us is that the US made calculated assessments of the strength and the nature of their client state, being Egypt. WikiLeaks tells us that the US was pre prepared to overlook a lot of things in Egypt, including torture, to maintain that very important relationship with those that are doing its dirty work. It's pretty hard to promote human rights leadership to a country which you rely on to torture prisoners for you. The hypocrisy of modern statecraft is pretty difficult to stomach. So, uncovering the truth about what governments are doing kind of sounds like what a media organisation should be doing. And in many ways, WikiLeaks seems no different to traditional newspapers. The cables are the brown paper envelopes of decades gone by. They are the Pentagon Papers of the 21st century. But one of the main reasons why WikiLeaks stands out so much is that so much of the mainstream press simply doesn't do its job. How many mainstream media organisations think it's their job to keep the bastards honest rather than slavishly entertaining us with the 24-hour news cycle? How many see their role as disturbing the comfortable and comforting the disturbed? Well, one is WikiLeaks, and the other, of course, is Al Jazeera. Indeed, Al Jazeera has the distinction of being one of the most suppressed news organisations anywhere in the world, a title it perhaps is competing for with WikiLeaks. And the suppression of Al Jazeera is not just limited to Arab dictators. In, you may recall that in November 2005, the UK Daily Mirror published a story it claimed that it had obtained a leaked memo, once again, from Downing Street, saying that President George Bush had considered bombing Al Jazeera's Doha headquarters in April 2004, right at the time when US Marines were conducting a very contentious assault on Fallujah. And today, as we meet here, Al Jazeera journalists are being attacked by Mubarak's thugs in the streets of Cairo. Why? Because Al Jazeera, just like WikiLeaks, tells the truth, even where the truth is uncomfortable. Indeed, it's worth noting that Al Jazeera has been embracing WikiLeaks tactics of late, as Jennifer noted, with the, wiki, with the leaking of the Palestine Papers. These were documents which provide an unprecedented insight into the peace process in the Middle East. Orwell famously said that during times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And these are exciting times. What's so exciting is that revealing the truth can now happen on a scale that was simply not possible even 10 years ago. The internet has opened a world of opportunities for the democratic spread of information. And WikiLeaks has a very important role to play in this process. It feeds crucial information into this framework and allows us to see the realities of politics. So to defend WikiLeaks is to defend the free press, and to defend WikiLeaks is to defend democracy.